Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Austin Haynes with the Waking Justice Project, and this is your daily wake up call. Here's what the corporatocracy is up to today, October 4th, 2019. You can visit our website at wakingjustice.org for more details. Here are the headlines. Author Kianga Yamada Taylor just published an article in Jacobin Magazine where she assesses the last five years of the Black Lives Matter movement. The movement began in 2013 with a series of protest marches in response to the Trayvon Martin case and an acquittal by his murderer, George Zimmerman. A year later, protests morphed into an uprising in Ferguson, Missouri, when teenager Mike Brown was murdered by police officer Darren Wilson. The militarized response to those protests by state police dominated news cycles for days. Over the next few years, there were more watershed actions in Cleveland, Los Angeles, and Staten Island. And there were countless other protests across the country, small protests in smaller towns, and mass demonstrations in major cities, including 50,000 Black Lives Matter protesters marching the streets of New York. And after every action, the protest imagery reverberated for weeks on social media. The slogans and chants, hands up, don't shoot, I can't breathe, and Black Lives Matter are now iconic to American protest culture. Now, five years later, Kianga asked in her article, do Black Lives Matter? At the midpoint in that timeline was the 2016 presidential election. So in her article, Kianga looks at the impact of Black Lives Matter on election politics that year. In the run-up to the 2016 election, President Obama hosted high-profile meetings at the White House on behalf of the Democrats, inviting Black Lives Matter activists to attend. But the activists were split about going. Some saw Obama's meetings as an opportunity to diversify their strategy, to build on the success of their protests, and to get into policy proposals to make, quote, busyness and constant engagement look like progress. On the Republican side, Trump used the Black Lives Matter movement to boost his white supremacist strategy. He berated Black Lives Matter activists as terrorists. He played to the, quote, Blue Lives Matter crowd and pledged his unwavering support to police. To make America great again, he'd say, we need to restore, quote, law and order in this country. Many consider such sloganeering from Trump as race-baiting rhetoric, what they used to call dog whistle politics. It uses coded language that has a benign meaning for the mainstream, but has a resonance with certain subgroups, typically racists. Most people associate dog whistle politics with the first half of the 20th century, the 1940s and 50s, at the height of the Jim Crow era. But as Ronald Reagan's campaign manager Lee Atwater explained in 1980, dog whistle politics has long been a core Republican strategy. As Atwater said, the Republicans adjust their language to match the current political correctness of the day. Here's a leaked audio recording of Atwater explaining his election strategy to attract crossover votes from racist Democrats. And trigger warning here. This is an original leaked recording that contains offensive language. So listen with care. Here's the recording. And now y'all are quoting me. You start out in 1954 by saying nigger, nigger, nigger. By 1968, you can't say nigger. That hurts your backfire. So you say stuff like uh, forced busing, states' rights, and all that stuff. And you're getting so abstract now, you're talking about cutting taxes and all of these things. You're talking about are totally economic things, and the byproduct of them is blacks get hurt worse than whites. And subconsciously, maybe that is part of it. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that if it is getting that abstract and that coded, uh, that, that, we, that we're doing away with the racial problem one way or the other. Uh, you follow me? Because obviously sitting around saying uh, we want to cut taxes, we want to cut this, and we want is much more abstract than, than even the busing thing. Uh, and a hell of a lot more abstract than never knew, you know. So I, any way you look at it, race is coming on the back burner. 
That was 1980, and the strategy worked. Reagan received the highest number of electoral votes ever won by a non-incumbent presidential candidate. His record landslide victory was due to high crossover votes from traditional Democrats, and not just Democrats in the Deep South, like everyone thinks, but in the industrial North and across the Midwest too. So why does so much race baiting work? Well, Kianga has a pretty good idea. In her number one best-selling book, Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation, Kianga writes, quote, pathologizing black crime while making white crime invisible creates a barrier between the two. It naturalizes black inequality, and that's not just hyperbole. Pathologizing black crime is one way that Americans are socially programmed for racism in America. How does it happen? Well, here's an excerpt from an interview with John R. Lichtman, who was assistant to the President for Domestic Affairs under President Richard Nixon in the 1970s, that gives a pretty good clue. It's a direct quote where Lichtman admits that the war on drugs launched by Nixon was specifically designed to, as Kianga put it, pathologize black crime. Here's the quote. The Nixon White House had two enemies, Lichtman explained, the anti-war left and black people. You understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black. But by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did, Ehrlichman said. So the war on drugs was designed at the highest levels of power in the US corporatocracy, and it's all about social control. As Kianga wrote in her book, it works to deepen the cleavages between groups of people who would otherwise have every interest in combining forces. Black lives can matter, Kianga concludes, but it will demand a struggle to not only change the police, but to change the world that relies on the police, to manage its unequal distribution of the necessities of life. She's talking about the struggle against the corporatocracy. She understands that all its major systems of oppression are interlocking. She understands that all of us in the fight across all sectors of global justice must resist the social programming that divides us. Only then will we be ready to combine forces and win the great struggle together. Amen, dear sister. If you want to learn more about how all of us in the work for global justice can join together and force this corporatocracy to the people's bargaining table to end all of this oppression, corruption, and destruction, and to save our planet, please go to our website at wakingjustice.org. Check out our about page, listen to our first podcast, and consider getting more involved. You can fill out our Join Us form at the top right of the webpage, or you can email us at info at wakingjustice.org for more info. We'd love to hear from you. We're running out of time, y'all. Join us. Peace. You must be involved in the struggle for freedom and justice. And Justice is waking, justice is rising, justice is waking, justice is rising, justice is waking, justice is rising, and it ain't just us, it's all of us, justice is waking, justice is rising, and it ain't just us, it's all of us, if it's bad, may every soul unite, tend to fire and let old coals relight, I'm a citizen of the world, and we fight for the rights of everybody to live a truly free life. Red or yellow, black or white, left or right, gay or straight, human or animal, all life. Cause what matters is what is in common. If you know it, stand tall and keep dropping the knowledge. Justice is waking, justice is rising, and it ain't just us, it's all of us. If it's our love.